said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Followed him. Every day these guys are going out and earning a living. They're throwing their nets into the water. They're bringing back their fish. It's a redundant, repetitive task every single day. Getting up early, sometimes they would fish all night. Hard work. They worked as a team, pulling in large catches. Some nights they didn't catch any fish at all. They'd go home to their families, go home to their wives or children. They'd have to worry about the, the, the ceiling has a hole on it and, and it's leaking and they have to get money. They have to go catch more fish so they can pay money to repair their house. And then maybe that week they didn't get that many fish and they didn't have enough money to feed their, their families or to buy shoes for their kids or whatever it was that they're encountering. But every single day they're met with the same kind of job. I, I think it's, it might be Sling Blade, I forget. There's a movie where uh, it's about a barber. <laughs> and, and, the, and the camera shows the tops of people's heads. And the barber, at, that's all he sees. He just sees one head of hair after another coming in every single day, one after another. And he's cutting the hair, cutting the hair, cutting the hair. For years, decades, cutting the hair every single day. We can easily fall into a redundant pattern in our lives because of our normal demands. If you're a landscaper, you're cutting grass every single day. And then all day long, while you're not talking to someone, while you're casting your net into the sea, you're just thinking about your problems. You're having this conversation in your head. How am I gonna get more money? Oh man, why did I say that to John? I'm always so, I say stupid things. Why did I get mad at my wife? Man, I wish I could get a better job. But I'm just stuck here throwing this net. You're going to school every single day. Man, doesn't that get boring? You got your blue days and your white days. Be somebody else. You got history on Thursday, everything. I'm going to this stupid cafeteria every day. Same bus, same faces. That's these guys. That's Peter. And then he goes to church. They called it synagogue. Every Sunday, every Saturday, I'm going to the same stupid synagogue. And this Pharisee is up here preaching. He's reading the word, but I don't think he knows what it's about. I certainly don't get it. I'm getting tired of the rituals. I'm getting tired of the routine in my religious life. And then one day while he's having these thoughts, I wish I could go to another synagogue. But there's only one here. I don't have a car. I have to walk. <laughs> I can only get the one synagogue. I'm trapped. But then he's throwing his net into the water and he hears a voice. Follow me. And immediately drops his net. He stops thinking about the roof. He stops thinking about everything else. And he gets out of the boat. And he follows Jesus. I can say, follow me. You're not going to come with me. You could be delivering your ups packages if you're an ups guy. You could be in your science club. Whatever you're doing, if I say, follow me, are you going to just drop it and just come follow me? It's the gentle voice of the shepherd. They hear it, and in his, their soul, they respond, follow me. There's plenty of time to go casting your nets into the water. But right now, I want you to follow me. Stop. Stop the routine. Stop the boring things in your life, and follow me. They were workers. These men were used to work every day. Strong men. And Jesus says, stop. I will make you fishers of men. Amen. There's a new routine. But the thing is, when you follow Jesus, it's not a routine. It's not labor like that. It's not boring. It's not redundant. It's not a ceremony. It's not whatever you're doing 
one time after another. Make another widget. Make another widget. No, follow me. Follow me. I'll make you fish. I'll make you have excitement in your life. I'll give you the purpose that you've been looking for. You've been dry and dead. And what, why am I alive, God? Why every single day do I go through this stupid routine? I don't like it. I don't want to do it, but I have to follow me. And what happens when they let down the net? They don't know where they're going. They don't know what he's talking about, fishers of men. He had work for them to do, though. And all of a sudden, he's, they, as they're following Christ, he starts to preach about the kingdom. He talks about how he's going to set people free and the good news and, 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 and binding up the brokenhearted. And then all of a sudden, the miracles start to happen. Wow. This is fishing for men? This is a lot better than that stupid fishing boat and the net that I was used to every day. All, but I don't have an education to go do this. All I know is how to fish. I never went to seminary or whatever it is. I never went to, I never got, I'm just a fisherman. But man, you said follow me and now my life is changing. My eyes are opening up. I just saw a cripple get off the ground and walk. I saw demons coming out of people. And when he talks, just like when he said, follow me, I see other people. His voice has power. There's something in what he says. It's very simple, but it means something to me. It's full. It's warm. It's life. Every time he talks, I can't stop listening. I don't know what it is. I'm just drawn into him. Follow me. And then the, the, the bread and the fish and the miracles of feeding people. It's an adventure. Fishermen on an adventure. And then after they spend some time with this fisherman, they start to do the work. And he sends them out in teams of two. Heal the sick. Cast out demons. Preach the good news. Fishermen. Wow. And all of a sudden, they see demons going out. They see people getting healed, people receiving the gospel and coming into the kingdom and saying, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And I said it with my own mouth. No education. Just what he told me to say. Just very basic. He's telling everybody here, follow me, follow me. Everybody here, everyone who's bored about their life right here, in this church, in these seats, eat you. You fishermen, there's a fascinating journey with Jesus that is waiting for you. He's calling you into service. No more boredom. It doesn't have to be. I know a woman who does nails every day. That could drive me crazy. <laughs> but she has made it an adventure that each person who sits down in front of her station is going to feel God. And every chance she gets, she tells them about Jesus and says, follow him. She prays for the sick. They get healed. It's an adventure. She goes to work on an adventure every day. You can do the same thing. We're called to do the same thing. Everybody's going to be working, but there are two kinds of work. Men try to build a tower of Babel. They made it out of bricks. The intention was to make it a safe place and to build it up to heaven. And God saw what they were doing. First of all, bricks speak about slavery. Do you remember that the Jews were in Egypt and they were told to make bricks? It was with their own hands. Whenever anybody made an altar to God, he said, do not kill the stone. In other words, don't. Don't break the stone. Don't use bricks. You just pull it out of the ground and you put it there. Stones instead of bricks because God made the stones. Man makes the bricks. And that is the pattern he wants you to have. Do things God way. Build it with my materials. Build it with my purpose. Don't make a tower of Babel because God looked at that and he said, there they go. They can do anything. Sure they can, but they're not going to do it according to my plan, according to what I want them to do. So he goes down and he destroys the thing. And he scatters everybody out and then gives them a different language because he didn't want them to build the tower. 
God will oppose us when we build on our own strength. God will oppose us when we are constructing things that are not by his plan. And Satan draws us into that activity. But when we build what he wants us to build, like in the case of Nehemiah, he sent Nehemiah out to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem that had been destroyed as the Jewish people were put into exile. He gave Nehemiah that mission. He didn't give the builders of Babel the mission. That came from Satan and from the pride of man. When Nehemiah was called into action, he came and he saw Jerusalem in a complete ruin. The walls were turned down and torn down and burned. And he was opposed. But he wasn't opposed by God. He was opposed by Shambhala. He was opposed by the Ammonites and the Arabs. He was opposed by the enemies of God. He was opposed by Satan when he was doing God's work. You see, you always have opposition. If you're building Satan's kingdom, God will oppose you. If you're building God's kingdom, Satan will oppose you. I would rather fight against Satan than God. Satan doesn't put anybody into hell. Did you know that? God does. Satan is not the judge of your destiny. God is. Satan has already been judged, and he's going to hell. He wants to try to screw you up so that you'll go along with him. God does. God is the one to be feared. God is the one we need to listen to. God has all of these things figured out. He knows. He knows it's more important to be a fisher of men than a fisher of fish. He knows he wants you to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Don't fool around with Babel. Nehemiah took on the task. And how did he do it? It's actually some things we've been praying about and talking about today. He assigns each family to a portion of the wall. What does the wall show us? A wall around a city in those days was for protection. Inside, when you're protected, you can grow, you can prosper. You're, you have peace. But right now, when Nehemiah shows up, there's nothing like that. The enemy can come and go as they want through that wall. So Nehemiah says, don't go farming. Don't go fishing. Start building. Each family, each person, you have an assignment to build that section right in front of your house. And as he starts building, Shambhala and uh, Tobiah and all of these Arabs, they stop because they, they see what's happening here. They don't want them to build the walls of God. They want them to think that they can't do anything. And they say... In Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 to 10 and 3 to 14. Now when Sanballat heard that we were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged, and he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, What are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? What are these feeble Jews doing? What are these feeble Christians doing? What are these feeble people who come into MY Church doing? Do you feel that way? Many times I said, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this small place? The enemy wants you to stop building what you've started. You've come here for a purpose. Paul's come here to lead us in worship. Pastor Malcolm's come here to bind us together. Maybe I've come hopefully to preach a little bit. My brother-in-law's got the camera. Kevin's got all of the administrative tasks. We are here together to build walls to keep the enemy out. But the enemy will speak to you and say, give up. What are you feeble people doing? Don't waste time. And worse than that, the enemy tries to take us away from that test with one another. When the Jews started to rebuild the wall, Jews were coming to them and saying, don't build the wall. We have to protect our farms over here. They had farms around the, the city. So they would talk to the workers and say, no Jews, come help your fellow Jews. 
Get off that task. You've got one task that God's given you. You have a task in your life. We talked about maintaining the dominion over our garden. There's a task in your relationships, in your families, in your job to bring Jesus and love into those environments. We also have a task as a big group in a church. There are different families here, but we're one family. We can't get distracted. You know, guys, I am intense. I know that. And I do get loud, but I want to explain to you why. You know my, my testimony. I, I, I was afraid in my life because of my father's alcoholism, of divorce. I thought I had no future. I thought I was going to be a fisherman for the rest of my life with no purpose. But I know it was because Satan was trying to keep me down. And why? I'm not building my kingdom, guys. I can go. I'm fine. Financially fine. I get everything I want. I want to see you guys. I want to see the portion of your wall constructed. I can't build it for you. But I can tell you as a soldier, as a diplomat, as someone who's been overseas and, and, and has seen what goes on and, and people do die, and I know that you can work together against an enemy and you have to. You can't go to sleep against your enemy. You have to build it. And I want you to be exhorted. That means to be empowered. I want you to know this is serious. There's nothing worse. I do get upset. I really do. When I see that people are just casual about God. Not because I'm trying to glorify my name. I, I just know the danger you're in. I know that Satan is around each one of us. And he wants to kill us and destroy us. He wants to take you out one by one. He is the wolf. And we are the sheep. But when you're together, when you build the wall together, when everyone's doing something for someone else and their, and their ground, we will build this thing together. It'll be strong and impenetrable. Everybody's going to get weak. In fact, he says, what are these feeble Jews doing? And if you listen to that, you're going to start thinking, what am I doing? I want to give up. For the people had a mind to work. Uh, Nehemiah says in verse 6, So we built the wall, and all the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. You see, when I'm getting kind of excited about things or, or taking things seriously, because I know you need to have a mind to work, but it can't be the mind for fishing or the Tower of Babel. It has to be a mind to build the walls, the kingdom of God. And you have to know that you have a place and a purpose in this construction. It isn't for the hired professionals. It isn't just for Paul and Kevin and Pastor Malcolm and me. It is every single person in here has to be working together. Amen. And we all has to have to see the danger. We can't just go to sleep. And, and that's why I want you to be excited about God. Yes. Because you're going to start working harder. Not because someone forced you. But when you get excited about the Lord and the power of the Holy Spirit and these things, and you see that you can have an impact on others around you, you can change your family possibly through the power of God. Your mother, your father can come to salvation, your friends, and you'll say, wow, wow. Instead of just focusing on my little task, studying my books, working in my job, I stopped and I heard him say, follow me, and I reached out to someone and I saw the kingdom being built because of my hands. Because of the work he gave me into my hands. Not because you did it on your own. And then you're excited. Wow, you step back and you look at the wall in front of you and say, whoa, I did that. I put those stones in place. Uh, that's cool. Oh, and look, look, Emily did that too. And, and then Monique, and we were starting to see the wall come together. But if it's just me building, we're not going to get there. In fact, the Jews looked at this and, uh, and they said, and there is too much rubble. Nehemiah says in verse 10, in Judah it was said, the strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. There is too much rubble. By ourselves, we will not be able to rebuild the wall. That's absolutely true. You can't do it all by yourself. And if one of us is down, there's an opening. There could be four people over here building a wall, but then this one's down. Satan's going to get through that little crack over there. 
Now, if you're not as strong as, as I am, or you're not as good of a wall builder, I'm going to try to come over and help you. But you have to build it, because I have work to do. I've got my daughter, I've got my wife, I have to go to work, I have to do these things. And, and during your hours, you have to do your thing. But maybe I see, I look over and I see, whoa, man, that's a big job for that little person over there. Maybe they're too young, they're, maybe they're sick, maybe they, something's not right. Maybe I can go over and, and help them out a little bit and get them excited because maybe they're ready to give up. And I said, look, look, all of the Arabs are outside here. You're going to build this wall and you're going to do it. It might take you a little longer than it takes me, but you're going to be part of this, man, and we need you. And you can do it. Look, come on. That's what I want. I want all of you to see that. I want to see your value. I want you to see your purpose and that this is a team. And don't get tired and give up. That's what Satan's always trying to do. If you look at the big problems in your life, you know, you got problems with your kids, you got a problem with your husband, your whatever it is, you can just say, I'm out of here. And maybe you get a problem in the synagogue, aren't you? And you just want to quit and give up. I'm amazed at how many pastors don't quit. I'm amazed at how many people keep coming back. That, that, that's the nature of what we're doing because we have people in this kingdom. God says, I will make you fishers of men. He doesn't, it's men, people. We're imperfect. We have problems. We're all at different levels. And we're trying to do this task together. It ain't easy. But through the power of God, over time, it will happen. And you will see the work coming together. You'll see a stronger church. You'll see a stronger family. And you yourself will be a stronger Christian. But you have to have a mind for the work. And our enemies said they will not know or see till we come among them and kill them and stop the work. He wants to kill you. So in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall, in open places, I stationed the people by their clans, that's their families, and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord, who is great and awesome, and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. That's what we're doing, guys. When you come to a prayer meeting, you're fighting. You're going to come and bring those prayers as a corporate body together. We're going to start building the house together. And you're going to be focused on the needs of your family, on the needs of your church, on the needs of this country. You know, every day in my job, I read what's going on around the world. And I'm supposed to be focused on one part, but I can't get my eyes off of another. I keep looking at what's going on in the Middle East and what ISIL is doing. You saw, hopefully you heard about the Egyptian Christians, 21 of them, their heads were cut off. They took hundreds of Assyrian Christians captive. They have burned people, they have cut their heads off, they have destroyed their homes. This is not a political movement. This is a work of Satan. Do you think that they have any love for you or me? They want to kill us. It is a physical manifestation of Satan's work. And the American church is asleep. The American government, uh, better not go there, <laughs> could do more. <laughs> to... Who's going to protect those Christians? What happens when it comes here? It's already come here, guys. I was in Tel Aviv when they, they uh, flew the planes into the World Trade Center. I watched it on TV in, in the embassy. I said, what is going on there? And then I find out 2,700 Americans, a mixture of people had died, not just Americans. It was the first time the Israelis called me on the phone. And they said, we're so sorry to see what happened. Before it was me, I'm so sorry they blew up your... Uh, your market. I'm so sorry these Jews got killed. And then they're calling me. Man, don't think you're safe because you're in the big banana here. <laughs> this big rich country. You know, on the streets of England, they pulled up. This already happened in America, in the Midwest. The, the guy the cut a woman's head off. Look, I don't want to scare you. I, I'm just saying this is the reality. This is true. When, when I lived in the Middle East, I had to be concerned for my life wherever I went. I, I, when I uh, 
He used to go to work in Gaza to work with the Palestinians. And every day, this is how I became a believer. I had to pray because I could die that day. And when I went home, I'm worried about my family because they were blowing up the coffee shop. They blew up the coffee shop my family had been in the day before. My wife, against my orders, went to get pork up in Netanya and took a, a woman from South Carolina, first time out of the country, but she wanted pork, she's from South Carolina. So she says, I know a good place. And the woman said to my wife, but my husband told me not to go there. And she said, it's okay. She goes to Netanya, and while they're there, kaboom. And my wife and this woman go under the table. And then the woman said, you said it was safe. And my wife said, oh, I'm never going to come here again. My husband told me not to come here. Then I get a phone call of this. You know, in other words, the reason I'm telling you this is it's a warning. We can choose to hear the warning and know that the enemy is on the outside trying to stop us. Or we can just ignore it and just go about our business and not take it seriously. When you take people into battle, or you take them on a mission overseas for the government, whatever it is, it's serious. This is more serious. But because you can't see it, you don't see the, the physical wall. You don't see ISIS yet with a sword coming out to your neck. But in the spirit, you need to recognize these battles are going on. You have to, and this is more important. This is eternal life or death. And that's why you guys are important. If you make a strong church here, you're not just saving yourself. It forms a basis, a family, a community, a strong tower to bring your friends in, to bring your uh, to lost friends, bring your family in. Put them into the center of a protected place where God's presence is. And there's love in that place, and the word of God is true in that place, and there's great worship in that place. It's a place to create things for the kingdom. It's a place to build. So I know each I could just say, oh, this guy's not important, or this he's too young, or she, you know. Yeah, no, it doesn't work that way. Everybody's important. And uh, we can't be afraid. And I looked and rose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers. Are you going to fight for me? That's why I asked them to pray for me Friday. I need someone to pray. Everybody here needs prayer. Fight for your brothers. I want to fight for you. When I'm praying at home alone, I have to pray for you. I ask you to pray for me. Pastor Malcolm, pray for everybody. I, uh, hey, I've been praying for the salvation of your mother and your family. I remember you asked me that. I want to tell you that because as I am encouraged when people pray for you, I want to encourage you. That's your wall. And don't think that when you told me that, I left you alone. Because this is my nature that God gave me. It is to fight for other people. Don't think I'm coming at you to try to tear you down. I want to build you up. But I also want you to see this is serious. I remember we went on deployment one time. When I, I was in the Air Force, but I worked with the Army and the Marines. And there's this one young girl, and uh, she's very small, and she's Air Force. And, and she uh, has all of this equipment on. It's a little lighter today, but it was a lot of stuff. And she couldn't carry it. And I'm Lieutenant Marshall or Captain Marshall back then, and I look at this, and I'm sorry, I wasn't saved back then, but I look at this and I say, Allison, you are a liability. <laughs> she, she almost cried. Okay, so now, now, the truth is, we cannot have everybody else carrying your bag all the time. Like, I can help Allison once in a while when she's tired, but I got my own stuff to carry. So, you want to build up your soldiers so that they're strong enough to take care of themselves and help other people. And in the Marine Corps, they teach you, you know, even if you're a cook, uh, you would have to know how to put a body over your shoulder if somebody got wounded. You see, this, this is warfare. It's, it's, it's not a joke. Um, it's not a joke. People are relying. But please, see this in your spiritual connection as a church. 
as brothers and sisters in Christ, help. Build yourself up. Get yourself in strong. We started Bible studies every Sunday to build you up. One person at a time. One family at a time. Coming to church every Sunday. You know, there are many messages God has given me for specific people. Do you know many times I preach those messages and guess who was not in the church? <laughs> over and over again, I see that. It's not an accident. You know, Satan is saying, don't go to church today. You don't feel well. Oh, Pastor Bill, remember the last time you went, he said this. And he looked at you. I had a lady, I had two people stop coming to church. One day I was preaching on jealousy. And I happened to look at this woman's eyes. And I saw her look back like, no, you're talking about me, aren't you? Well, no, I'm talking about everybody. But she was convicted, and she stopped coming to the church. I'm <laughs> okay, we got to be big girls and big boys. And we got to see if there's some, some dirt in me, I, have, I reevaluate myself all the time. Because I want to be strong so I can build my wall, and I want to be able to reach out and help you build yours. And when I'm looking a little tired and old, and that might happen someday, I need you to come and help me. I'm taking, change my daughter's diapers. When I'm old, I pray God she will be there to push me along, feed, feed me my oatmeal. <laughs> Take turns. And you know, uh, none of us are perfect. I'm not perfect. If I make a mistake, give me a chance to make it up. I, I'll say I made one mistake here. I probably pushed you guys too fast in the beginning. And why? Because I saw the enemy coming in, and I saw people like hanging out without a mind to work. I'm just being honest. I want to wake you up. Man, you'll be amazed at what God will do through your life. Amen, Jesus. It's all real, and it's all available to you. You don't have to be the widget maker. You can be fishing for men. Let's build the wall together. And don't be afraid. Let's make sure I didn't miss any gems here. Well, the Lord tells us to build our house on the rock. In Revelation, those fishermen, the tax collector, those guys that the Lord called out and said, follow me, they might have given up their income to go follow Jesus. But in the end, in Revelation, it says that the 12 foundation stones, we're going to kick Judas out and put Matthias' name on one of them, form the foundation for the kingdom of heaven. The walls of the New Jerusalem have the names of those 12 men that started this thing. He said, he, on this rock I will build my church. There's a rock underneath him. It's called, he's called Jesus Christ. It is your profession of faith. That's what Peter said. Jesus says, who do you say I am? Jesus says, you're the Christ. He said, oh, upon this rock I will build my church. He's going to build his church, and then he's going to put Peter and Matthias and Andrew, and he, these are the foundation stones. And then there was another layer that came after them. Then you have Paul, and you've got the next group, and then all the way up to this point right now, we are at a certain level in the wall, and it is our turn to build. It is your turn to build the next layer. Nehemiah said he only got it up to half height. We're taking it higher but I want my name on that stone. I want to be committed in the building of this wall. Right now, you, the Bible says you were chosen for this time, this place, with these people to build. The, Holy Ghost. the men that started this thing. Got a little story. Stole my notes. First of all, don't steal my notes when I'm I want to read these to you. Matthew. Because he left the tax collector's desk. And his name is one of those stones on the church of New Jerusalem. He suffered martyrdom by being slain with a sword at a distant city in Ethiopia. Mark. He died in Alexandria, Egypt, after being cruelly dragged through the streets of that city. Luke was hanged upon an olive tree in the classic land of Greece. John was put in a cauldron of boiling oil, but escaped death in a miraculous manner and was afterwards banished to the Isle of Patmos. Peter was crucified at Rome 
head down because he didn't see himself worthy of being crucified upright like a savior. James, the greater, was beheaded in Jerusalem. James, the less, was thrown from a lofty pinnacle of the temple and then beaten to death with a fuller's club. Bartholomew was flayed alive, cut open. Andrew was bound to a cross from which he preached to his persecutors until he died. Thomas went to India and was run through the body with a lance. Jude was shot, shot by arrows to death. Matthias was first stoned and then beheaded. Barnabas of the Gentiles was stoned to death. Paul, not one of the 12, unfortunately, not Paul. But he was tortured and then beheaded by, in Rome by Nero. Foundation, you guys are warriors. Paul tells us in Acts 14, 22, strengthening the souls, he went around to the churches, of the disciples, which is you, encouraging them to continue in the faith, and saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. It ain't easy, but it's where we're going. It's the only answer you and I have. It's not easy, but you don't quit. Don't quit. I don't care what mistake you've made, or what horrible sin you've committed, or how bad your life seems, keep going. Don't quit. If those men had quit, the 12, if they went back to fishing and tax collecting, no stone on the bottom. You guys are stronger than what you know because of Christ. If you commit to him. So do it. Do it, guys. Um, let's pray for one another. If you guys can just grab a friend, grab their hands, tell them not to quit. Pray that they're going to build their portion of the wall. Pray for their family. Pray for them to be excited about Jesus. Please, guys, this is important. Learning to pray for one another. Fight for your brothers and sisters. If you love me, pray for me. Father God, as we get ready to pray, as each person gets ready to build, start building their own portion of the wall. God. Holy Spirit, I pray encouragement on these people. Lord, I know the great potential that you have for them. Lord, I pray that you use them, Lord, that this place shines, God. That there's love in this house, God. That there's power in this house. There's power in each of their lives. That they live for a purpose. And we're going to take communion in, 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 in when you're finished doing this. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Mm -hmm.